uh, webinars. <clears throat> Welcome to our first webinar in the fall series of health, uh, healthy brain, um, uh, healthy brain webinar series. Uh, healthy brain webinar series is presented by the health matters program. We are at the Department of Disability and Human Development at the University of Illinois at Chicago in partnership with National Task Group on Intellectual Disabilities and Dementia Practices. And we're funded by the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention through the Healthy Brain Initiative Award. Um, contents are solely the responsibility of the authors of the webinar and do not represent the official views of the CDC. A couple of other pieces of information. Today's uh, webinar would, for, for today's webinar, we do not offer CEUs. Each live webinar will be recorded and available to view on YouTube with resources to download, including the PowerPoint deck. Uh, an email will be sent to you once the contents become available. So that usually takes about a week and I will send the email. So for today, I wanted to introduce Susan Mullins. She will be discussing improving, improving medication administration oversight for people with intellectual and developmental disability. Um, the webinar will cover the training that she developed for home managers and discuss ch challenges with medication administration, explore styles of adult learning and design proposed training to better equip home managers to complete oversight of medication administration. A little bit about Susan, our presenter. Susan graduated with her BSN in nursing from Kent State University and had spent her entire 25 year nursing career in developmental disabilities nursing. Currently, she's employed by the Summit County Board of Developmental Disabilities as a quality assurance registered nurse. She completes reviews where medications are administered by unlicensed personnel. She also serves as a resource to providers, support administrators, and other nurses in Summit County and throughout the state. Susan has served as one of six Ohio Developmental Disabilities registered nurses instructors since 2012. In 2022, Susan was a member of the inaugural class of the Galisano Institute for Developmental Disabilities Nursing. Susan, welcome and take it away. Thank you. I'm excited to be with you all today. Um, and what I wanted to share with you is um, what Yasmina was mentioning is um, a training that I um, developed to hopefully better equip unlicensed home managers um, for the task of overseeing medication administration. Um, so as Yasmina mentioned, I'm going to skip our slide order here a second. Um, I currently work in Summit County at the County Board of Developmental Disabilities. Um, so Summit County encompasses the city of Akron. Um, if you've heard of Akron, it could possibly be from our um, one of our most famous residents, which would be LeBron James. So it is the hometown of LeBron James. Um, in terms of people with um, intellectual and developmental disabilities, our county board um, serves about 5,000 people with intellectual and developmental disabilities throughout their whole life cycle. Um, so while Summit County as a general population is not very big, we do serve quite a few individuals. Um, we are actually fourth in the state um, behind where you would picture the bigger cities like Cleveland, Columbus, and Cincinnati. We are right behind that. Um, and we have, and it's kind of a fluid number again right now, um, we have about a thousand agency and independent providers um, that provide services to Again, those persons served with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So in terms of medication administration, um, everything starts um, with our state Department of Developmental Disabilities. So the Ohio Department of Developmental Disabilities or DODD um, has established rules um, in terms of what medication administration looks like um, and they also publish curriculum um, to train those unlicensed personnel of how to administer medications. Um, and then nurses go through registered, registered nurses, I should clarify, um, 
take a training course to be able to train the unlicensed personnel um, how to administer again. Oral topical is our main course of medications. Um, and then there's additional add-ons that personnel can take to for G2 medications or insulin if needed. So then they earn a state certification and that state certification is valid for a year. And so then every year um, they have to go through a recertification process. So one of the things that I was noticing um, as I was completing quality assurance reviews. So I go out um, as a nurse, as a representative of our county board um, and apply our state quality assurance tool um, that looks at how medication administration is going for those unlicensed providers, um, what's going well, um, and also what needs to be worked on. And one of the things that I was seeing um, was some challenges and some lack in oversight um, of medication administration. So in terms of oversight, how that works, once somebody earns a certification, and I know this chart doesn't copy super well to a PowerPoint, um, but if you see those settings in yellow are all where medication administration can be done without nursing delegation, which also translates to without nursing oversight. So again, those unlicensed providers earn that certification, they go back to the settings that they're working in, um, and those settings in yellow are where the bulk of our services are typically provided. Um, they go back to those settings, administer medication, and they don't really ever have to come in contact with a nurse again going forward. So the oversight function is then done by unlicensed personnel. So there is no state course in Ohio to train somebody to oversee medication administration. Um, and especially now with the state of our field, you know, the supervisor tends to become, or tends to be the person who hasn't quit the longest, right? So poof, you're a supervisor, now you have to oversee medication administration. And while someone may be good at administering medications and may be a dependable employee, you know, it's a whole nother thing to take on this oversight function that they really aren't necessarily always equipped to do. Um, and so then we're starting to see, or we're definitely seeing medication administration completed with incorrect technique, which obviously then leads to more medication errors, um, which endangers the health of the people that we serve with IDD. So what my goal was, was to create a training for managers. So I was trying to think of how I could help. I thought, well, could I potentially put together a training for these unlicensed managers to kind of give them more tools to help them better oversee medication administration? So my initial design was something that lasts around four hours, right? So that managers could hopefully come again. Definitely we need everybody to be working right now. So I knew I couldn't tie them up for a, an extended period of time, but hopefully they had a block in their day where they could come for four hours um, and involve some lecture elements so that they could hear from me as a nurse in terms of what correct medication administration procedure looks like, but also some hands-on elements so that they could practice things and not just listen and hear, um, but actually do things hands-on to hopefully cement it more. Um, and then they could have peer feedback. You know, this sometimes is a really lonely field to work in. And if they're the, own, the home manager just sort of feeling like they're by themselves, like could you talk to other people who are doing the same thing as you? What are you seeing? What questions do you have? Because maybe other home managers have that same, those same questions as well. Um, so, and as you uh, saw from my slide about our provider community, we have a decent amount of providers. Um, so while I would have loved to 
offer this to everybody. Um, I knew I needed to start small, right, to see how this was going to work. So I picked two of um, our larger provider agencies just to have a base to start with um, to see how it would go with them and whether it would be a worthwhile thing to sort of roll out to our county as a whole. So again, the potential long-term outcomes um, from this training would hopefully be um, that we would see improved technique, right? that people who are administering medications would do it correctly every time, that they would do those three checks of the six right, so they would know why they're administering the medication that they're administering, that they would remember to document, right? All of the things that go into medication administration. Um, that would hopefully then lead to decreased medication errors, right? Again, then again, better health and safety for our person served. Um, and then ultimately for this to be successful, I knew what I would need it to be um, is something that became internal to the providers themselves, um, that I could start it out, but again, for it to be dependent upon me um, to continue would not have any chance of success. So what I was hoping was that the providers would see that this would be a benefit to them and would then want to take it on internally as a part of their processes. So in terms of the demographics of those agencies, so I have agency A and agency B. So agency A, um, has one main residential director. Um, they do have a training coordinator that also goes out to all of their residential locations. Um, they have about 12 home managers and about 125 to 150 staff. Um, and then agency B has one residential director. In addition to that, they have two regional directors. Um, so they split, they have 14 homes and that's the way there's 14 home managers. So those two regional directors split those 14 homes between the two of them. So one is responsible for seven, the other is responsible for the other seven. Um, they have about 200 to 250 staff. So again, they're pretty substantial agency. Um, they also have three nurses on staff. Um, now with the way our field is designed in Ohio, again, with that nursing oversight not being required, um, it also means that there's really not any funding um, for those nursing positions. So while there's nursing there, um, they primarily fill other roles. Um, this agency also has a clinic where they see, um, they have doctor's appointments, psych appointments, things like that. Um, so the nurses are pretty involved with that clinic. Um, they are available for questions and concerns that the staff might have. Um, but in terms of actually day-to-day -day oversight function of medication administration, that's not really what their primary role is. Um, so I did do some delving into literature um, in terms of different aspects of setting up this training. So one of the biggest things that I looked at is medication administration challenges, um, which we all know there are quite a few when it comes to our field. Um, so the biggest one I think is that the people that we serve um, get large amounts of prescription medications. Um, when I observe a medication administration, the average time that it takes is about two hours. Um, so again, it's a decent chunk of time, a decent chunk of medications. I have seen um, some persons served get upwards of uh, 17 to 20 medications at one time. Uh, so that is a lot for anybody to be responsible for. Um, they're also complex and changing drug regimens. You know, doctors are constantly changing the medications that they're trying with our person served. And a lot of times they'll be titrating one med up and weaning another med down. Um, so there's a lot of times that medications will change frequently. There's a lot of different doses. 
So keeping track of what are we giving this day at this time, again, can be challenging. Um, definitely confusing medication administration rules and guidelines. Um, so the laws and rules for our state, for any state really are written in what we call legalese. Um, so I think they're challenging for almost anybody who's not an attorney to try to figure out, um, let alone our unlicensed providers. Um, and rules change all the time. So again, them keeping up on what the current rules and regulations are is challenging as well. Um, and then navigating a health system unprepared to work with people with intellectual and developmental disabilities. Uh, so it is a lot, right, for that unlicensed person um, to be responsible for doctor's appointments because they have to communicate with that doctor, um, understand what the doctor is saying back to them, make sure that all the issues were addressed, um, and then go back and communicate all of that information to all the other staff that work at the home. Um, and like we, like it says, and like the literature shows, our health system really isn't still um, prepared to work with people um, with intellectual and developmental disabilities. So that is a whole big hurdle that everyone has to try to climb. Now, in terms of adult learning, that was one of the other things that I looked at, right? I'm planning a training session for adults. So what are some keys of adult learning? Um, so one of the biggest things is adults need to be involved in planning and evaluating their instruction. You know, adults learn what they wanna learn, they learn what they're interested in. So if you're planning something for them, you need to try to involve them in what is going to be taught. Um, so what do they want to learn about? What questions do they have, right? Are we addressing that? Um, they're also most interested in learning things which have immediate relevance to their job or personal life. So that was one of the things that I really tried to look at um, when I was designing this. Could we do something that they would immediately be able to take back to where they're working, translating it to the Mars that they have to, again, to the medication administration, to all the things that they're doing in their job, because if it didn't feel relevant to them, um, then they really weren't going to be engaged or take a lot away from it. Um, definitely problem-centered. So we wanna make sure we're addressing like, here's the issues that we see, right? And here's how we're going to try to address them. Um, and the same thing kind of, as I talked about in the second point, transfer of learning has to occur, right? So how are you going to take this, what we're doing in this setting, which is not where you work, um, and translate it to where you do work? So this MAR that we're gonna practice with, how do you use it with an actual MAR, right? And when we're practicing our skills, how are you going to translate that to the actual staff that you oversee? Um, and then definitely hands-on activities, and I knew, from the start, if all I did was get everybody together and lecture to them about what correct medication administration oversight looks like, that the takeaway wasn't going to necessarily be what I wanted. Um, you know, because you forget a lot of what you just hear, but what you hear and see and do, you have a much greater chance of retaining. So that is what I wanted to try to do, make sure they heard and saw and did. And then the other thing I looked at in terms of the literature is what does good supervision look like? Um, so good supervision helps staff feel supported and valued. You know, that is a crucial need in our field right now. We're trying to obviously re main, or retain as many personnel as we can. So how do we help them feel supported and valued? Can that home manager feel, you know, help those staff feel supported and valued? And then also how do we have that home manager feel supported and valued in the role that they have? Um, makes expectations clear from the beginning. And one of the things that I read a lot about was using skills checklists um, and how skills checklists kind of hold everyone to the same standard. Um, you know, everyone still really wants everything to be fair, right? So 
we're holding people to the same by using that skills checklist that is the same for everyone. Things don't seem as arbitrary, right? These are the standards that you're held to. And what I found with a lot of the managers um, is they really weren't aware that skills checklists existed um, or how to use them with the staff. So that was one of the things that we really tried to work on is here's this checklist that holds everybody to the same standard. This is the standard set out by the state that everyone has to do. Uh, regular feedback is important, good and bad. You know, I think when people only hear feedback of what they're doing incorrectly, um, that can be challenging. You know, they need to hear when they're doing things well. So we talked about giving good feedback. Um, but also feedback in terms of things that need to change um, needs to be given immediately, right? So that that person doesn't groove those bad patterns over and over and not have a way to get out of them. Um, and also it needs to be in a way where that person doesn't feel like they're being attacked, right? For doing something incorrectly. Um, so again, we wanna show respect to each person as an individual that we value them and then it keeps the communication clear. So the challenges of setting up this program, as you can imagine, the staffing crisis um, was the biggest one. So we actually, since the pandemic um, came out of that with lower staffing than we did going in. Um, so since the pandemic, we have staffing at historic lows. Um, and so most of the time now where managers are, they're basically being called upon to provide direct care and cover shifts. Um, so setting it up was challenging. Um, I started setting up this program in September of 2021 um, and did not get to complete any actual training sessions um, until May of 2022. Um, and it wasn't for a lack of trying. Both providers really, really wanted these sessions to happen. Um, it just couldn't happen because of staffing. Um, the other thing with managers is they're, you know, because they're the manager, anybody calls off. If you can't get somebody to cover that shift, then you have to cover it no matter how many hours you have worked that week. Um, so we have a lot of managers that are working 80 plus hours a week. So again, could not get away. Um, from the setting for any length of time, not even four hours to come to a training session. Um, and they really were not, you know, we looked at the literature in terms of giving input for what they wanted to learn. Um, and that was something that was really challenging for me to get any input back from the managers. They just um, didn't have time to even think about <laughs> Uh, what they wanted to learn because everyone was just focused on more day-to-day -day survival. So finally, like I said, in May, with agency B, right, which was the provider that had the 200 to 250 staff and the three nurses and the two um, regional directors, I was able to hold um, two times that we did four hour training sessions. Um, I did send out an anonymous questionnaire to the managers prior to the training session um, and then reviewed effective procedures. The man managers had dialogues with each other and then they got paired up to practice things hands-on. So just to break down a little bit more what that looked like in practical. So the questionnaire I sent out um, to the regional manager who then distributed it to the staff. Um, so I asked them to rank. Um, what's your level of confidence in medication supervision? How confident do you feel giving feedback to people? Um, and do you feel like you're prepared for this medication oversight role? Um, and then I had open-ended questions in terms of, do you, again, do you have any questions? What do you hope? when this training session is over, 
what do you hope that you will have learned? And as I mentioned earlier, um, I really didn't get a great rate of return on the questionnaires. One of the things that I would like to think about going forward is maybe how to do that a little bit differently in terms of getting input from the managers, because I definitely want that to happen. I want them to learn what they want to learn. Um, but having them complete that questionnaire and get it back to me really did not work the way that I had hoped it would. Um, I did get feedback from some of them and then sort of went based on what I was seeing in reviews in terms of designing the bulk of the training. So then, like I said, I did a, a little bit of lecture um, and gave them things to write on. They could ask questions. I asked them to share their examples of things that they may have seen um, as I was talking. So we discussed, okay, so this is what medication administration should look like. Um, and how do you review staff technique? Again, how do you give that immediate feedback? Um, so that somebody doesn't groove those patterns of doing things incorrectly. You know, some of the other challenges that they have, how do you schedule doctor's appointments? Um, during the pandemic, doctor's appointments were something that really, really got offline. So it was very hard still for the managers to kind of track who should be seeing what doctor and when. Um, and then how do you communicate with that doctor um, if you have questions or you're not understanding what the doctor's saying? And then how do you communicate the results back to everybody else? Um, and things like reviewing the supply of medications. Um, one of the things that I was noticing as well was that people were running out of medications um, that they should not ever be out of. Um, so how do you make sure that you're getting that information, that you're reviewing it as a manager, that we're getting those medications for those persons served so that they never go without? Um, we also talked about reporting unusual incidents. Um, so the managers as a whole were pretty good at recognizing, okay, this is a medication error um, and we need to report it, but in terms of what you need to do about it from that point, how are we going to make things different so that this medication error doesn't happen again? Um, that was where they were struggling. So we talked a lot about that, um, about how do you go forward to ensure correct technique when a medication error happens. And then obviously the big challenge, documentation. Um, transcribing new orders onto Amar and making sure that they have all of those um, different rights that need to be on there and not just the name of the medication. Um, reviewing documentation for medications administered. Um, and what do we do about blank spots, right? And how do we make sure going forward that blank spots don't happen? Um, and then again, reviewing those Mars as well. So again, they got to take notes, they got to ask questions, they got to dialogue with each other during that time. So again, I try to make it as interactive um, as possible um, so that it wasn't just them sitting, listening to me talk. Um, and then after this point, um, I didn't include this in a slide, but we did break for lunch. Um, I felt like it was super important um, if I'm asking people to come for four hours, that I gave them food um, so that it was one less thing that they had to think about, you know, and people don't learn well hungry. Um, so we did provide lunch for them. And then after that, we had them pair up um, and do some hands-on practice. Um, so I had prepared a MAR um, that had built-in errors. Um, and then I did a medication pass and made mistakes myself. So as I was making mistakes, I would say, okay, so did anybody catch what I did? Um, and what would you say if you saw somebody doing this, what would you say to them? Um, and then when they paired up with each other, I gave them the DODD checklist. Um, so like I said, that was something they weren't super familiar with to say, here's your standard. This is what you should be reviewing everybody on. I want you to observe each other, give feedback to each other. You know, and there's something when you pair up peers, 
where they really can talk to each other more than they would talk to my to me or to the other nurses that work at that agency because they feel better asking questions of each other. So the nice thing was with the nurses. Um, while I mentioned that those nurses don't really have a ton of oversight responsibility, they did come to the trainings. Um, and so we all sort of wandered around the room while the hands-on practice was going on to sort of listen to how interactions were going and then to make sure that no incorrect um, information was being shared between the two managers. Um, so again, they observed each other. Um, they looked for the errors on the Mars and talked about what they would do to address those. Um, and then we had them practice transcription. So we had a sheet with different orders that they had to write on the MAR. Um, they discontinued one order, they started another order. Um, they did a time sensitive order for 10 days to sort of mark off how that time frame would be. Um, and then they switched, which um, our protocol in Ohio is that someone else then has to review that MAR. So they switched with each other. Um, to look at each other's transcription. And again, we're able to tell each other, yes, that was correct, or hey, wait a minute, you need to do this, or you need to do that. Um, so those such, that actually went really well. They interacted great with each other. Everybody really got into um, doing the observation and, and trying to find the things in the Mars um, and doing the transcription. So I was actually very pleased with how well everyone was engaged and how well they interacted with each other. Um, and then at the end of the session, I had them fill out an anonymous evaluation and ask them, did they, do you now have increased confidence um, in your role? Um, what did you learn and how are you going to implement what you learned um, in your actual day-to-day -day settings? So that transfer of learning again, how are you taking what you learned here and keep, you know, transferring it to where you're at. So some of the feedback that I got, um, these are some direct quotes from the evaluations. Um, we don't know what you don't tell us. So one of the things that became clear, and again, what, why I was really happy that the nurses had attended, um, was that there was sort of an expectation um, that the nurses had of things that managers knew that they didn't know. Um, and so the managers communicated um, to the nurses, hey, we don't always know. If you don't tell us directly, we don't know this information. Um, and then on the flip side of it, the nurses also said that to the managers. Um, there were a lot of situations that came up that we discussed that um, nursing would say, well, you should call us about this. Well, you should call us about this. Um, and the managers hadn't really even thought that that was something that they could do. So, the nurses said that to the managers, hey, we don't know what you don't tell us. If this, you know, if these sort of things are going on, you need to call us. Um, so it made the agency sort of see where their gaps in communication might be and how they could work on that. Um, somebody said they liked learning to give feedback in real time. Again, that was one of the takeaways that I really wanted people to have was giving that real time immediate feedback. Um, so again, somebody doesn't groove those incorrect patterns. Um, I did not want to come today, but I'm so glad I did. So just to clarify that feedback, um, I'm sure a lot of managers maybe initially felt like that, <laughs> um, but this was directly, this person, unfortunately, had had to work a whole overnight shift, um, thought that she was going to be able to get home and sleep, and then the agency told her, no, well, we really need you to come to this training. So made total sense why she didn't want to be there. Um, she did not present that she had been up all night. I actually didn't know that until the training was over. She was super engaged, asked questions the whole time. Um, but I'm glad that she was honest, you know, like, hey, this is a lot still. Um, and then remembering to set a good example. So one of the things that I talked about um, when we did lecture um, is that you're an example, whether you know it or not, as a manager, Everyone is always watching you. So as soon as you model in correct practice, that becomes the new standard. 
So if when you're administering medications, you do it correctly every time, because if you're doing shortcuts, everyone else is going to start doing it too, because you modeled it as a manager. Um, and one of the things actually that came out of the training as well was that sometimes the managers were the ones that were administering medications with incorrect technique. Um, so we made sure, okay, let's get you back on where you're supposed to be. This is how you need to give meds and how you would expect everyone else to give meds as well. So again, working around the pandemic was a big lesson um, and that training needed to be flexible. One of the things that um, I'm considering as we look at potentially rolling this out to the county um, is how can we do this fitting into staff schedule? And um, will it involve something that's recorded? And so how can we record that and also keep that interactive element um, with the peers? And you know, if I'm not in person, or the, will the people who I entrust to do the hands-on part or oversee the hands-on part, make sure that they understand what correct medication administration looks like um, as they complete that part. Um, and then, like I said, training and staffing issues have, con turnover and staffing issues have continued um, since the training, unfortunately. So a lot of the managers who I worked with <laughs> Um, are actually no longer at that agency anymore. So what we're potentially looking at is starting from the bottom and doing it all over again. So agency A, um, through the span of trying to do this, um, agency A realized that this is not something their staff could do right now, that medication administration oversight was just too much to ask the managers to do. So they hired a nurse um, and her only responsibility to them um, is to teach the medication administration courses to their staff and then go to every setting that they have and do oversight of medication administration. So she's taking on that oversight function right now. Um, and that has worked out really well for them. Again, they just decided right now that was a cost they were willing to incur to sort of ease some burden on their staff. So since then, like I said, the training went really well. And as I interacted with the different managers in the different sites at those agencies, um, they were super excited. They took the Mars back to their staff um, and had them look at like, hey, can you find the errors on this? They had them practice transcription. They were um, doing really well with observations. And like I mentioned, the further we got away from the training, the more people started to leave, the more staffing issues are arising again. And so it's sort of taken a backseat again um, to day-to-day -day survival, which I understand. So like I said, we are working with the agency at this point to the next steps um, and may have to start all over again. And that's something that I was sort of aware of that this may take a while, um, before it sticks. And like I said, my goal ultimately um, is for the agencies or the providers to take ownership of this themselves um, so that we don't have to repeat the same process, that it would just become something that's internal to them. So again, once we um, get more settled, we're going to roll this out hopefully to the rest of our provider community, um, working on the partnerships we have with our provider. And again, I um, working on what went well um, with that first agency. Um, and that first agency does want us to train all of their staff. But like I said, I think what we need to do is kind of go back to the beginning, work with the new managers that they're getting in place, go from there, and then look at offering it to all the agencies in some cases. So what I wanted to end with with this, and a lot of you may know from looking at this picture, um, what this video is. Um, so this is a video that I actually showed um, to the managers in class, which is obviously Lucy and Ethel and the Chocolate Factory. Um, and to me, it's a really good sort of metaphor, if you will, um, of what our medication administration systems can look like. 
um, where the chocolate starts out really slow and they're wrapping it slowly, you know, and Lucy makes a comment of, well, this isn't too bad. We can do this. Um, and then it starts coming faster and faster and faster and faster. Um, and Lucy and Ethel basically do anything and everything that they can do to make it look like they're doing their jobs correctly. Um, and Lucy again makes the comment, I think we're fighting a losing game. Um, and that's kind of what our medication administration, I feel like can feel like sometimes like, oh my gosh, we have to give this many meds in this little period of time. Um, and this is, there's no way we can be successful at this. So that was one of the things actually that I asked the managers was, do you think Lucy and Ethel would ever have success? Um, and everyone pretty much agreed that they would not. And it wasn't that Lucy and Ethel were not good at their jobs. Um, it was that the systems around them were not set up um, for them to ever have any success. So we look at oversight as one of the effective systems that we can put in place. If oversight is completed well, then hopefully medication administration will be completed well. The staff will feel more supported and our persons with intellectual and developmental disabilities will have better outcomes. So it's all in putting those systems in place that are effective um, for everything to go the way that we hope it will. So I did include um, some references from some of the materials that I used. Um, and then this is my contact information. So thank you everyone who joined. Um, I appreciate everyone's time today. Um, and it did look like maybe there were some questions in the chat that were coming up as I was talking. Um, thank you, Susan, so much. I, I it really thoroughly enjoy listening you talk about um, this. There are some questions, so please feel free to put any questions you have in the chat and I will, I'm monitoring and then I will try to um, ask them. The first question is, thank you for a very helpful presentation. Are any of the providers you work with certified as ICF IDD facilities by CMS? We do have some providers that are ICF. We just don't work as much with them. Um, so yes, we do have some. Okay. Next question, we have a high number of uh, medication error reports after switching from a paper MAR to an EMAR. Sorry if I'm not saying that correctly. Most of the reports are due to giving the meds outside of the two hour window and also forgetting to document a med that was given. How could we reduce our med errors in regards to these two examples? Um, so we've seen, that's something we see a lot. Um, and sometimes it just takes that period of time to people adapt to that change. If they've always had a paper MAR, um, and now all of a sudden they're using that EMAR, right? It's somebody's comfort level with technology and remembering their password and is the device charged. So it's kind of setting those reminders. Um, some EMAR programs, and it depends on which one you use, um, sets up an app on somebody's phone that's secure. So we've seen some decreased errors with that because people typically remember, again, their password for their phone or what they have on their apps on their phone. Um, so initially you may have to set in more built-in reminders um, until somebody gets used to using that technology um, and having that paper mar as a backup um, is, can work, but also be more confusing at the same time because in terms of reconciling documentation, but that paper mar sometimes as a backup can help um, because people remember to document on that if they don't document on the EMAR. Thank you. Uh, can you share how long the agency with the dedicated nurse trainer has had this in place? Does it seem like a sustainable system long-term? Um, yes, the nurse has been in place for about um, almost a year now. So they started with her in January. Um, and it does seem like she has really built a good relationship with them. I think part of the key is finding the right person, right? So the nurse really understands the DODD rules, understands the curriculum. She has built a good relationship with them. 
Um, and I think they see it as such a value um, that that is a relationship that they are going to continue for sure. Is there an interest in the state of, of, of Ohio to have your training available across all of the county IDD boards? Well, that would be the long, long term goal um, for sure. I would like to get it set up a little bit better in Summit County, but then definitely um, my big, big picture vision is to approach the state with this. Thank you. Um, how do you train unlicensed personnel to recognize possible side effects of medications and understand and address the possible implications of a med error for an individual to maintain safety? Yeah, side effects are challenging. So what we look at is having that side effect information available um, so that they can look at it. Um, but honestly, what we expect them to do is recognize if that person doesn't feel well and then contact somebody who is a healthcare professional. Um, so we don't really re expect them to say, oh, this is a side effect from their medication, um, but it might be. What we want them to do is talk to somebody who has a little bit more knowledge, a little bit more authority, um, and then they can follow that information. And I think that was one of the things that we talked about as well in the training is comfort level and calling the doctor, right? When you think something is wrong, um, a lot of managers are hesitant to do that, but hey, you know, when you see something going on that doesn't seem right, you need to be reaching out to that doctor, that pharmacist, you know, at this agency, it was those nurses to call and say, hey, something's up with this person. Um, this is what I'm reading. Are there side effects? Could it potentially be that? How long is the original training for certification to administer meds in Ohio? and how long for recertification? And what is the procedure if a person who is certified does not rectify every year? So there is, um, the initial course has to be a minimum of 14 hours, um, and that covers oral, topical, um, and there's 13 specific health-related activities. And like I mentioned, that is taught by a registered nurse trainer. Um, so then every year, that staff needs to complete two hours of continuing education and have a skills check completed. Um, and like I mentioned, in the settings where nursing delegation is not required or where nursing oversight is not required, that does not have to be completed by a nurse. Um, if that person does not recertify, they have 60 days where they can um, complete those requirements. They cannot be administering medications during that time. Um, but they have 60 days, a grace period, if you will, where they can complete those requirements and then resume medication administration. Um, after those 60 days, then they have to repeat the entire course again. Thank you. A follow-up question. What are the 13 activities? Okay. <laughs> Test my brain here. Okay, so they are Vital signs, so that includes temperature, pulse, respiration, blood pressure, um, pulse oximetry, uh, application of prescribed compression hose, um, CPAP and BiPAP, uh, cough assist, which is that device that sort of stimulates a cough for someone who can't cough on their own, a percussion vest. Um, Gosh, now I'm drawing a complete blank. Um, so I'm going, they are available on the DODD website and I apologize, I usually do know them. Um, I am just drawing a blank on the rest of them right now, but if you get the general idea that that's what, um, what those health act related activities would involve. Thank you. Um couple more questions. Um, does Ohio Nurse Practice Act mandate that all CBOs have nurses for medication oversight? No. Mm -mm. Um, again, it goes back to the settings that people are providing services in um, and where nursing delegation is not required also means uh, nursing oversight is not required. Oh, that's interesting. Um, 
Does the program include introduction to calculations related to dosing of medicines, especially liquids? Health numeracy is often a problem in general when it comes to dosing. Yes, and that is actually something our unlicensed personnel are not allowed to administer medications where they have to calculate the dosage. Um, so that does go back to when we did mention that with our with the the doctor appointment training that we did, like, hey, if a doctor gives you an order like this, then you need to have that conversation with them of why you can't accept that order um, and what fits for our requirements. Uh, thank you. Can you speak a little about creating a culture of safety around reporting medication errors, non punitive, but still maintaining a high level of expectations around safety? Yeah, I think we always just try to communicate, you know, that that person served has to come first. Um, you know, and the reason that you should be in this job is because you want to keep them as healthy and safe as possible. Um, so even if you made a mistake and you're afraid to admit it, um, again, you need to think about their health and safety, what's going to happen to them, um, you know, and if you own it, honestly, it's much better owning it from the start than having somebody figure it out later and you didn't say anything. Um, because that could lead to, there are, there is a place in Ohio where you can, um, the system that keeps track of everyone who has a medication certification, um, where we can put what we call notations. So when somebody would do something like that, that would get recorded on their certification that, hey, they made a med error, they did not, uh, you know, own up to it. So that goes to then, should that person be certified in the future? Thank you. Oh, someone just wrote a basic clean dressing, ah, external catheter care, um, yep. ostomy emptying care, a, ostomy care, and emptying a catheter bag. Yeah. So, Thank um, you. Beth also found Ohio DD curriculum um, a, uh, that it's approved approved for a medication administration certification. So I'll just put the link there. Um, awesome. So uh, you can, uh, the attendees can use it as a reference. Yeah, and um, there's also, if you go to the DODD website, um, in addition to the curriculum, they also have skills checklists for um, everything that's in the curriculum. So the oral topical skills checklist, skills checklist for all the health related activities. So if those would be a benefit to you um, at all their public documents on the DODD website as well. Um, Another question, my organization here in Iowa is about to start rolling out an in-house unlicensed medical manager class that I'm currently coming up with the curriculum for. Do you think it would be beneficial to add an additional class for the unlicensed supervisors? If so, what do you believe was the most beneficial component of your training of supervisors? And what do you believe was the biggest takeaway from the four hour class? Um. So, yes, I do believe it's benefit again, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, I think managers are often put in that supervisor role without really knowing what all of that responsibility entails. Um, I do feel like, honestly, the hands on practice was the most beneficial to everybody again, and sort of cemented everything in their heads. Um, they got to engage with each other um, and that seemed to be again, the biggest takeaway. For me, just seeing in the settings, you know, where they took those Mars back to the staff and we're having them look at them and practicing transcription with them and things like that, um, that they really felt like those were a benefit, not only to them, but to share with their staff as well. Thank you. Um, what if someone has a GT who administered, administers the meds and feeding? So, GTube is a little bit more involved so that is not one of the settings um, that does not require nursing delegation that actually does um, so what would happen is a person would earn their certification one so that basic oral and topical one they would then need to um, earn an additional certification so there's another class um, that is a four-hour add-on they refer to it as um, to learn how to administer medications and nutrition through a g-tube 
and then a nurse has to come out um, and delegate the, that nutrition and that medication administration to that staff. So they have to follow procedures for nursing delegation. The nurse then has to be available, has to come out and see how the staff is doing um, with that task and that medication. So definitely when someone has G-tube, nursing is much more involved. Thank you. Um, any other questions or any other last sort of parting words from you, Susan? No, if you, um, I think you're going to share these, the slides with everybody, right, as well. Yes. Um, and yes. then my, my email is on this last slide. If you think of something later or want to reach out to me, um, definitely email is the best way to reach me. Um, so feel free thank to reach you out so much. You that. And thank you again for everyone's time today. Um, I wanted to thank you, uh, Susan, and thank you all for who have joined. We had a really nice uh, turnout. Over 300 people actually registered. It's an important topic, and I actually received a lot of emails about it as well. Um, as Susan mentioned, we are recording this, and I will make everything available, including the PowerPoint, within about a week, and it's going to be um, emailed to you so you will know where to go. Um, one more thing next week we are um oh um i wanted to announce our second webinar which is the topic is improving access to home hospital for people with intellectual and or developmental disabilities it's going to be on november 15th the same time i will put it in the chat so um if you have interest to join us please do um for that webinar again thank you so much susan and thank you all for um, coming to our first webinar have a great rest of the day bye thank you susan thank you